Hello, everyone, and welcome to and welcome to this forty days live event. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the anti-racism and equity lead at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. And it's very good that you're here. This is a bilingual event that is offered in both English and French. So if you were to hover over um, the bottom of your screen, you should see a little globe. If you're able to um, choose the language of your preference, then you will hear the language uh, of your choice throughout this gathering. Uh, this gathering today is with members of the Then Let Us Sing group, and we will be with them today. Uh, they will introduce themselves shortly and we'll have a time of engagement. Uh, but just to note that this gathering is one of the 40 days, part of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, which is a, a program that's been going on for the past several weeks. This is the last live event in the series. It's being recorded as all other ones were recorded as well and are available on um, the United Church's YouTube. Um, as well, there have been daily reflections, there have been books and lots of resources that have been available on the website. So if you have a chance to explore that, you would be very welcome to. So with that, though, um, I would love to be able to introduce the members of the Then Let Us Sing group um, through a series of questions. There was a panel who will be engaging with us for our time today as we explore the topic of copyright, justice, and musical misappropriation. But first, we will begin with a gathering. Yep. Hello, my name is Paul Sales and I'm a member of the uh, Then Let Us Sing Working Committee and I'm welcoming you to our service, not our service, our, our evening, our gathering. And uh, the reason I said service is because this opening is coming out of the Then Let Us Sing Hymn Festival that we've created. So let's, uh, let's gather and, and join with me in responding, please. I'll take it to the next slide. Sorry, Brian. To you, God, our treasured holy mystery, we cannot keep from singing. With faithful voices, we cannot keep from singing. We sing of grace. We sing of God the Spirit, faithful and untamable. We sing in trust. We sing of God the Christ, the Holy One embodied. We sing hallelujah. We sing of God's mission. We sing of a life beyond life and a future beyond imagining. Grateful for God's loving action, we cannot keep from singing. Then let us sing. Then let us sing. I was, before we start the gathering song, I, just, I skipped over the actual introduction I was supposed to make, which was about where the project came from. And just give you a bit of a background on it. So we'll do this before we sing. Then Let Us Sing is an online music resource that will make most of the hymns from Voices United, More Voices, and Nova Genie, plus approximately 150 to 200 new hymns and songs available in one digital location and under one copyright license. There will be over 1,200 hymns in all. Uh, there will also be a hard copy supplement of the new music for people who might want to have, have those songs uh, in a book for use. The uh, keyword of, of the whole project that we have, that we seem to keep coming back to is its versatility. The project includes all permissions required to use the music and worship according to your needs, whether that's copying the music out, whether it's printing it for your congregation, whether it's projecting it on a screen or whether it's live streaming, you'll pay one, one licensing fee and that will cover everything. So there's no longer any more, uh, won't be any further worry about whether you have the rights to, to use it in different formats. I'm going to go back up here just for a second. Um, another key part of the versatility idea is that because it's digital, we'll be able to add new music in future years. So this isn't going to be a one-time uh, platform, a one-time one project. It's going to continue over the years so that we'll keep finding new music and be able to put it on the right on, on the platform um, without having to worry about printing a new book, etc. And it lets us respond to the needs of a constantly evolving church. 
it's also compatible with gatheringworship.ca for worship planning. So people who will be using gathering to plan their worship, as they see hymn suggestions in gathering, they will be able to, if they have a, a they subscribe to the Then Let Us Sing uh, a platform, then they will be able to uh, go and look up the hymn and decide whether they want to use it and, and, then, and work from there. I do have to say too, we have to acknowledge that we have several partners working with us on this and two key ones are corporate partners, Hope Publishing and GIA Publications uh, or OneLicense.net. Um, they will help us ensure that there's a just administration of copyright and that they, and they, their goal is to empower artists and crea creative communities across the world while ensuring that there's dynamic access to customizable musical content for congregations. So they're working together with us on this in a truly unique relationship. We also are, are include in our committee and in our work, the two full, full communion partners, the United Church of Christ in the US and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Canada. And we're also working with ecumenical collaborators from the Anglican Church of Canada and the Presbyterian Church in Canada. So that's the basic background, and um, uh, we'll have time for questions a little bit later on if you'd like to, to ask things then. But now, as we said, then let us sing, then let us sing. And our gathering song is One God, Many Names from the sampler. So if you have the sampler and you can open it, fine, the words are there. And please join me. I'll play it through once and then we can sing it. Thank you, Paul, for gathering us uh, in song. So now as we, um, it, it's our time for our panel discussion and uh, um, I will offer a question for a conversation. So everyone, can you please tell us about your role in Then Let Us Sing and how the anti-racism principles adopted by the development committee affect your work and what has been one of your biggest learnings? I think, well, I can start. My name is Olivia Smith and I am staff support for Then Let Us Sing. I work at the general council office uh, in the church and mission unit. I'm aware that the translation booths might be off. So if you are in the English booth, you might not be hearing the right thing at the moment. So if you could let Brian or myself know, I think we might almost be sorted. <laughs> so, uh, my role is to help support the work of Then Let Us Sing, which is a real privilege and honor to be a part of. And the anti-racism principles of Then Let Us Sing have been core and foundational to our work. And I'm really proud of that, of how everything we have, everything we're doing is shaped by principles, practices, ideas and and theological ethos that we have spent a lot of time and investment in so it's so well thought through and i'm really appreciative for that piece of the work and maybe i will pass it to i hear paul's phone ringing so maybe i'll pass it to bruce <laughs> thank you olivia yes i'm bruce harding and i sit on the material curation committee for the project so the people who are responsible for gathering songs and bringing them all together. I'm also the music editor for the project, so I'm responsible for 
for taking the decisions we make and um, getting them onto the printed page. So that's also, that's for the new repertoire that we're selecting for the supplement for Then Let Us Sing and also trying to bring our principles to life in, as we deal with the repertoire from our existing collections from Voice United and More Voices and No Voice Uni. So unique challenges trying to live into our principles and when when our hymn books are statements of where we were at at that time um, to try and reimagine them and and um, reinterpret them is challenging and exciting i'll say both of those things <laughs> and who's next um becca sure my name is Becca Whitla, and I teach practical theology at St. Andrew's College in Saskatoon. Um, and uh, but came to my academic interests through singing as a as a vital, I might say, the vital part of worship. And um, I'm I sit on the uh, Education, Justice, and Ethos Committee of of this Then Let Us Sing project, and it's been my honor to help shape the the kind of theological underpinning for the project, which has drawn on um, and tried to define what makes a United Church hymn resource United Church. So we named all of that in our original document, um, and then. Uh, and grounded it theologically, sort of in, in interculturality, in anti-racism, -raci in expansive language, all those good things. And, um, and then did some work with Lydia, and she'll be sharing more about that later on a, um, a document which is about copyright. And I, I really love the document because it's about relationship. It's about our, how, what's important in, in, copy, in paying attention to whose material we use is our relationship with those people. So I'll leave that there for now. Um, but that's who I am. And I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to see friends in the room. I guess I can go next. My name is Paul Sales, as I said earlier, and I'm um, I'm a member of the actually I'm, I'm a member of the Marketing and Animation Committee, uh, which is responsible for uh, creating awareness about the project, uh, educating, teaching about it, I guess. And uh, we've created brochures. We chose the name for the for the Not a Sing, um, and all the so looking at all the. All the ways that we can promote it and animate it, get people excited about it, and and currently we're we're very involved in in getting the word out there and introducing sampler songs to congregations and, and groups. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be part of this, and for me, I mean, it, it's not as though um, thinking uh, in terms of um, anti-racism in my work is is new. It's just that thinking it completely from looking at words. Uh, things we've we've sung or music that we've received in new ways and saying oh gee is that really the right wording is that is that is there something in there that's just going to uh betray um our our principles you know they're going to going to go against what we're what we're professing to do the church is changing and i think with the work i've been doing it's been part of the the teaching process to help some congregations and some groups understand why why this is important to us and fortunately we're able to do it through music which is a way that everyone um everyone feels comfortable uh, um and every in a, in a, it always ends up being a more relaxed atmosphere when we sing i think so that's it oh and i'm, I'm my my current role uh, professionally is that i'm a recovering church musician Great, thank you panel members for introducing yourselves and sharing a bit about um, the principles and how that affects your work. So for the next question, uh, if some of us, some of among you, if you could tell us more about how, how and why copyright is understood as a justice issue. Oh, sorry. Did you want to talk about your, your learning? You're good, okay. Uh, tell us more about how and why copyright is understood as a justice issue. And how does respecting copyright help communities engage in anti-racism work? I can start off that question. As Becca had mentioned, 
part of um, Becca is part of the the, the, uh, the Education Justice and Ethos Committee. And the first thing that the Education Justice and Ethos Committee did in the height of the pandemic was create a theoethical framework that would guide all of what we did as Ben let us sing. So that would guide all of our work. And part, I'm just gonna read a snippet from the theoethical framework because that really led us to these larger copyright conversations. In the theoethical framework, we say, because we celebrate the image of God in all people and cultures, it is important to acknowledge the origins and creators of hymns and songs and to pay people royalties for their work. As with more voices, as more as with more voices, we noted that questions of copyright are a justice issue. Remuneration for copying needs to get as close to the source as possible. We are aware that dominant cultural voices in the global north have used and abused the cultural treasures of people from the global south and those marginalized in the global north. We pledge to work against this reality and we wish to iterate ways to ensure copyright justice here. So this was part of our theological ethical statement grounding the beginnings of Then Let Us Sing and then Becca and myself and Jennifer Jensen Ball, who um, is the executive minister for theology and I forget. <laughs> well, you could correct me in the chat <laughs> for the general counsel office. Uh, got together to really unpack what we meant by that. So what was our own theological understanding of copyright and why was this important? And I really loved the conversation that we had there and we realized we realized that our hope uh, Jennifer Jennifer Jensen balls is the executive minister for theology and leadership. And I <laughs> and I missed something there too, but don't worry, you get the idea, so <laughs> our hope. Uh, our hope with the copyright, but also with our hope for then let us sing was to help to build the church we were going to become so building our vision of becoming an intercultural church an anti anti-racist church an anti-oppressive church and an affirming church we realized that we needed to work with god to create and to model create a glimpse of god's beloved community and that kind of rootedness in god's beloved community is what anchored our theological statement so when we think of the beloved community, we think of a place where things are held in common. Like you think of that church in Acts, right? You think people are holding things in common. You're, you think of a place where every single person is valued and respected and honored for the gifts that they bring. You think of a commitment towards equ equity, but sustainable equity and mutual relationships, mutual respect we're changed and transformed by each other. And you think of a community that celebrates and lives into God's vision of a place where everyone thrives and everyone gets abundant life and fullness. And in order to get there, there needs to be reparations, there needs to be restoration, there needs to be reconciliation. So all of this came into our copyright statements. And we realized that that's a lot to put into copyright, but copyright, we often think of copyright in the legal sense, but not often in the communal sense or in the moral sense. So we think of copyright legally, which is the rights that we have to reproduce something. So how we copy or use or make a duplication of something that does not belong to us is basically our copyrights. But we also have all this other obligations to think about. So we have the legal obligations, but there's also the moral obligations and there's also the community standards. And we really wanted people to think about, well, what is gonna help us build the beloved community? Sometimes the legal requirements isn't what's gonna do it. Sometimes it's the moral obligations or the community obligations, because we all have different understandings of what it means to reproduce something. So. I might feel like it's a tribute. I might feel like you're copying me. I might feel like I am inspired by. 
So there are all these different ways that we think of reproducing something, but how my cultural understanding might be different from somebody else. And if I see it as an honoring and you see it as a duplication, now we're having a break in relationship and we're both not being honored. And this is not building, this is not going towards the, the building of the kingdom of God. So how do we talk about working together and lifting each other up and and sharing in a way that honors the the communities where the music comes from, realizing that it's so complex and it's so different. But the other thing that we really realized in all of this is we we recognize and we know, we fully understand that due to racist structures and due to colonialism, the structures that we currently have for copyright and copyright justice are often oppressive. And they often include racism and sexism and all of those other systems and isms in it because that's what systems do, like, right? They systemically oppress. So in that sense, the Western copyright practices are often building into Western capitalist cultural practices. So that's where we, we see clearly that the legal obligations is not the moral obligations. So legally, you might have the right to take this song indigenous to this community because it's 500 years old and it's public domain. But morally, you don't have the right to do that because the, that, commu that community might not buy into the Western copyright understandings of public domain. So these are the sorts of things that we really wanted communities to start to wrestle with. So in creating this document, we hope to, we hope to create a sort of um, baseline or starting ground to help people start having these conversations around how do we see copyright as a way to deepen relationships? How do we see copyright as a way to work towards reparations and restoration and right relations? How do we see copyright as a way to seek justice and equity and to start to provide some language for that so that it wasn't a burden or a chore to do copyright, which is what it often ends up being in your week to week Sunday routine. Like, ah, I can't get permission for this. This is frustrating. It ends up being more about the legalities as opposed to being about the restoration of relationships and the honoring of peoples. So that's kind of, I don't want to take up all the time, but, <laughs> but I can talk for like hours on copyright justice as we all can. But I think, and please I'll open it for Becca and Bruce to elaborate, but I think that is what our understanding is or my understanding of what we're trying to do with Then Let Us Sing and copyright justice and what we mean by it being an anti-racism and justice issue at its core. I, th I think for me and the marketing and animation group, um, for us, it was, uh, I, I didn't anticipate how much we would be relying and coordinating with the Ethics, Justice and Education Committee in, in how we communicate. Um, to, to me, it was, uh, I just thought, well, okay, you've got this, this product, this project, we just figure out how to how to market it. But so much of the language we used and the the, um, the teaching that we're able to do in our in our webinars and etc. Um, is really based on understanding the theoethical framework and seeing um, my ideas of, of justice have expanded. Um, the whole idea of copyright justice has gone from just the simply making sure people get paid for the music we use into the whole idea of being um, making sure that we are, are are justly identifying where the music has come from and then helping to get the um, the revenues back to them as we can. But it, it did affect we had to keep revising some of the things we were writing in the first year based on what the EJE produced and also information we got from the marketing or the material curation committee because that kept Everything, everything was morphing and we, we all were, were, we're all one in it. So it, it was fascinating to me. That was my main learning of, in the whole project. Yeah, 
I think I would um, uh, just agree with everything that's just been said for starters um, and just uh, maybe make a connection to uh, the 40 days campaign and the other issues that are present um, and particularly to highlight um, I kind of don't like the word intersections these days because it gets overused, but I know that that's been a theme that has been discussed. Um, and I think it's really, it really comes to, to the fore when we talk about our worship, our worship and hymn resources and how we approach them. Um, so we, all of the intersections of, of oppressive structures come together as Lydia was just talking about. And um, I think for me, if, if we're focusing on anti-racism, then what needs to be named is that, um, that in a sense, um, copyright justice needs to look at the difference between how communities and artists get remunerated for their work. And um, I just really want to underscore what Alidia said about um, communities, like a lot of songs from the global South or uh, marginalized communities in the global North. So the predominantly racialized communities are held by the community. So how do we pay somebody when there's no artist to pay which is the sort of, um, you know, Western European system for appropriately honoring a, a song's creator. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not the only way to do it. One of the things that's really exciting, I think, is that the United Church is working at a way to, to actually take uh, loyalties from the use of songs and pay them to a community rather than to um, um, a particular artist when there's no um, when there's no particular artist named. So um, and that is really changes the framework of the conversation. Um, and I and I'm I've been um, telling people like in the hymn society and other organizations about this statement on copyright and and I hope somebody might put a link to it because you can get it for free and share it with all your friends and, and I really think it's a a really deeply theological and deeply Christian way to look at justice. Um, you know, justice for racialized people, justice for marginalized communities, justice for artists. Um, it's all kind of encompassed in there. And it has this um, uh, loving theological um, undergirding that really roots it. And so I, um, I just kind of wanted to make those connections with other conversations, um, including conversations around um, decolonizing, right? What what does that mean in turn with respect to um, racial justice and with res respect to um, other kinds of justice? And how is it all connected in our practices in tangible ways? So, so we really try to root it theologically, but also be practical. And um, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, with some very concrete suggestions for everybody about how we can do that in a little bit. And I would just affirm what everyone has said. This is this has been my life's work for the last 20 years or more. Um, when we when we were working on the More Voices project, we really wanted to deal with that whole issue of copyright as a justice issue. And so we did things like like a song would come to us and it came to us with a copyright on a translation and a copyright on an arrangement that were these these were vested to major corporations in the US. So we would do our own fresh arrangement and and um, try and release release the copyrights so that so that royalties could start to flow in, in new directions. We didn't have the system set up at the time, so we were investing copyrights in the United Church, but they're now being passed over to partner organizations that, that are and relationships that have been formed through the then let us sing project so it's nice to see some of those seeds from years ago come to fruition today because it is a huge issue you think of a song like see a humba we are marching in the light of, light of god is the the arrangement and the translation are copyright walton music corporation 
And it's the way the American copyright system works when a piece is registered, it's it's owned by that, whether it's just or not, it's owned by that copyright holder for all time. So those are the issues we're dealing with, trying to trying to break open a system and find new ways to 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 be creative and, and support the, the bringing in of the kingdom of God. Thank you for that rich sharing about copyright justice. Uh, I'm intrigued by the phrase singing justly. So could you tell us a little bit more about what that, what this means? And is it another way to look at avoiding cultural misappropriation or is there something more? I think it's over to me now in our in our planning that we had yesterday. So bear with me. I'm going to sing a couple songs and I'm going to ask you to sing and I'm going to look at your screens while I ask you to sing and hope to see some movement. And and um, and and so you, if, if I'm going to ch chat with you for probably 10 or 15 minutes and just get into this a little bit. So the first thing I want to say is that um, this thinking about copyright and anti-racism comes as part of um, an, a larger anti-oppressive agenda, which is clearly articulated by the United Church. So that includes things like gender justice and through, th through expansive and emancipatory language. Uh, it, it includes justice for LG LGBTQ plus communities, affirming uh, a, a commitment to being affirming. It includes um, uh, a commitment to interculturality. It includes a commitment to justice for people with disabilities. It includes um, uh, anti-racism commitment. So all of those things are kind of part of what was undergirding the theoethical statement and the copyright work that we did. So I just want to, I can't resist bragging about a couple of songs that are in the sampler. So here's one, just a little bit. And if you know it, please do sing along or if you catch on to it. This is, um, this is a rethinking of a passage from Luke chapter 15 verses eight to nine about, um, about the widow who is looking uh, for her hidden treasure. So here's, here's how it goes. Uh, just a little snippet of it. God lights a lamp and she searches everywhere for the hidden lonely heart. God lights a lamp and she searches everywhere when she finds you. Oh, she I have found my treasure, my precious silver coin. I have found my love, even angels will hear the news, what once was lost. So there's just a little bit of, of that song, obviously imagining God in the feminine. Here's another, just one verse of, um, a, of a hymn called Queerly Beloved. Queerly Beloved, we have assembled, joining in wonder. Singing in praise, lifting our hearts, praising our voices, trusting in hope, in love and in faith. Oh, 
So there's another example. And, and just to point that one line, lifting our eyes, that can also be sung, lifting our hearts. So I wanted to just point to some things that are not explicitly anti-racist, but that are wildly and radically inclusive following in the path of Jesus. Okay, so just to, to kind of put this work in that bigger context. Um all right, let's sing this next song and then I'll chat a little about this. Um, this is in, um, in um, More Voices, uh, this beautiful chorus uh, from the Congo. And I, I really hope to see some of you moving and singing along. Please do join me and sing in harmony. I know it's hard to do that on Zoom, but I swear I can hear you in my mind's eye if you do it. So here. Let's hear it. Maybe my some of my family's over there eating dinner. Maybe they'll sing along too. No, they're shaking their heads. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, here we go. Mungu ni mwema. Mungu ni mwema. So that's Swahili, right? Let's sing it in French, please. Save So that song was a beloved song in a community where I worked. And I uh, was working with my son um, on a service to thank uh, some caregivers who had been looking after him while he was sick. And he chose this song because he identified it with our community. Our, it was a heart song of our community. And um, I said, well, don't you think we should sing it in English because people won't know it in Swahili? And he said, no, the song goes mungu ni mwema. That's how the song goes. And so um, what I appreciated about it, and here's there's a connection between language and anti-racism, right? The language of the song is important. And so it's, um, c'est vrai, Dieu est bon, right? It, know that God is good. And I recently was... Um, a privilege to be working with the Western Intercultural uh, Ministry Network, uh, an, um, an organization of uh, ministers and lay folks in the West of Canada. And we sang it in other languages as well. Other African languages were added to the mix. So this is a great song. To find out who your community is, what language they speak, and figure out how to say, know that God is good in multiple languages and sing it, right? Um, I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about what singing justice means, singing justly, singing with justice means to me. And there are three main points that I want to make. They're all about relationship. And so for me, that's the key. Uh, the first is about context and relationship. The second about accountability and the third trans transformation. So here we go. Why would we, and this also um, deals with the question of cultural misappropriation. So we can't talk about singing justly without dealing with that. And we can't um, be an anti-racist church, an intercultural church, an affirming church, all, all of those things, unless we think about what it is we do in worship and how we reflect that, that justice in what we sing. So, why would we even sing another song, right? And this, this, I also want to name something else, which is that I um, take this work really seriously as somebody who is racialized as white, right? I have a responsibility um, as a leader to ask really, to interrogate my own methods, to interrogate what I'm doing, to figure out whether I'm doing and singing justly along the way. So, so I just want to kind of 
throw that into the mix as well. That's a lot. So why would we sing another song? Is Are we just doing it because it's entertaining or exotic, a nice rhythm or melody? Or are we actually reflecting a, a liturgical theme or a theological theme in the service? How will the connection be made? So I'm going to ask a bunch of questions and give some answers, but mostly I'm opening up questions for conversation. Will we repeat the song? Do we just do it this one Sunday or will it become like Mungu Ni Mwema did for my son, the community's heart song? Is the song that we sing or the prayer we pray part of a broader attempt to diversify the repertoire of the community? How will it be introduced? Are we learning about the place where the song comes from? Are we including the place and its people in our prayers? It's, it's about, you know, when we introduce a song, I could have, I didn't, because we're kind of having a panel discussion, but as we sing this song, let's remember the people from the Republic of Congo and lift up their struggles and pray that their, their quest for justice may be met. And, and, you know, it could, it could be more than that, but, but there are ways to do it. So um, we can honor the creator, the community from which the song comes and how we introduce a song, perhaps with a prayer, as I just illustrated, or a note in the bulletin, the prayers of the speak, people could specifically name the communities where the song comes from, and we could refer to it in the sermon. So for me, these are all ways of deepening our engagement with what we sing as well. We put songs into our body and they live in us, right? So how can we embody the theology that we're singing and how can we connect it to the rest of worship and the rest of our lives? Okay, so the next level, so that's a first level of kind of honoring where a song comes from, the people whose song it is. The next level is, um, is a, kind of ramps up the accountability by inviting deeper engagements. Are there people in your community from the songs community, either in your congregation or in the surrounding community? What are their heart songs? Can you have conversation? If there are people in your community, what, what, you know, find out what their songs are. Could they invite, be invited to share in the leadership of the song? And if there isn't anybody from that community in your um, congregation, can you seek somebody in your surrounding community to come in and, and, and be paid to work with your choir or work with your congregation and the leadership of it? So can you build relationships then beyond your own church community. Like this is a great way to actually deepen the church's work and build relationships beyond Sunday morning congregations. Then there's transforming relationships. So I believe that if you sing justly, if you take all this work and do it seriously, and it is work and it's risky work and it, it requires an ongoing committee, we can be changed. I know that I have been changed by this work. I've been converted, you could say. I've been transformed. So we build relationships with people, both near and far, that are connected with the songs we sing. And then how can we seek justice for those communities, both, again, locally and nationally and globally, right? So how do we take it beyond our worship and into tangible actions for justice by our communities? Um, and I'm going to stop. Uh, there's a couple more songs I think I'm going to um, just mention briefly, but I want to highlight something that Olivia said about the copyright document. She talked about reparation, restoration, and right relationships. These are the three the different three R's, right? <laughs> um, and so there's, for instance, in the in in some parts of the U.S. and perhaps in Canada. There are moves now uh, by some communities when they sing um, uh, spirituals, black spirituals, to pay a local black community since there's no author, um, it, when there's no author who, who's credited with the song. So that's a kind of move towards reparation, right? So actually, re and, and that builds uh, rest, restoring relationship 
it also restoration acknowledges the risk. That's another R word, but we might make a mistake. And what happens when you sing a song and a relationship is broken? How can you work at restoring it? And sometimes the stakes can be really high. I, I say that out of my own painful experience of having hurt people by making mistakes. Um, okay, so I think all of this is, is, to me, is about the work of being a Christian in community. It's all connected to how we live and how we model the beloved community that Olivia referred to. So just going to talk about these two other little songs. Um, the one is the, okay, the, the one that's on your screen is Si el Espíritu de Dios. And I'll just share. So this, I'm going to sing this in French and invite you to sing along with me. Quand l'Esprit de Dieu habite en moi, je chante comme David. Let me hear you in my mind's eye. Quand l'Esprit de Dieu habite en moi, je chante comme David. Je chante, je chante, je chante comme David. Je chante, je chante, je chante comme David. So that's one way of singing this song. I learned this song um, from a, communi a community of Spanish speakers that I was working with. And it went like this. Si el Espíritu de Dios se mueve en mí, yo canto como David. Si el Espíritu de Dios se mueve en mí, yo canto como David. So that is um, a... Um, a different, a, has a different rhythm and a different way of singing. And I think it points to the fact that we need to be in relationship. So wherever the song comes from, we need to find uh, folks who can help us learn how to sing it in a way that's authentic. The other song I just wanted to mention, which you might encounter is um, Juka Seo Wan, Wang Wi Ye. My apologies to Korean speakers. And there are some here for my mispronunciation. This is a fabulous song. And there were questions about us including it, uh, apparently, because of the huge musical range. It's very, goes very high and quite low. Um, and, um, you know, has a theology of the throne. But this is a, a fantastic song in multiple languages. In, 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 the, in the sampler, it's in Korean, Spanish, German, French, and um, English. And what's exciting about it is that it, it represents our, the wider global spirit of ecumenism. When I look at the people who translated it, those are people who, who are partners and friends of the United Church and who work with the World Council of Churches. So there's, a, there's relationships woven into the songs themselves and the people that create it. And this song, um, uh, so there's this chorus uh, I'm going to do it actually a little lower lower than is written, but Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Holy God of Heaven, Glory, wonder, Wonderful, Mighty, God is our Sovereign on high. It's a fantastic song. The God of glory goes up to the throne. Why do you tremble and why do you fear? Our fear, sorry, our hearts and spirits are dancing for joy. God is our sovereign on high. And then there's this great chorus. Hallelujah. And it goes on and there's the possibility of drums and um, uh um, the uh, of a of a whole community being engaged. So if I was going to do this with this group of us assembled here, if we were all in the same space, I would be running to some of the folks whose whose names I recognize as Korean and asking them to lead it with me. So that and I would be trying to learning um, to pronounce the words in Korean with them. Um, so those are all the kinds of things you can do to tangibly embody singing justly. I'm going to stop <laughs> and leave it to somebody else to answer the next question, I think.
Thank you, Becca. Uh, Bruce, did you want to answer this question as well, please? Um, I would just, well, just affirm everything that Becca was saying. I don't need to say too much. Um, aside from, you know, the sing justly, we're coming back to the copyright issue again, too. One way to sing justly is make sure that we actually print the information with the words. Lots of communities are following, the, like, legally, you can add all your credits at the end of a service document rather than putting them with with the words themselves. But what does that do in terms of helping people to see what we are singing when we're singing it? So th thinking of how we present the, the words in the music as well is, is an important part of singing justly. If I could just add to that, um, in my own congregation here in Orleans uh, on Sunday, they presented the song we just sang, and uh, um, I'm not sure whether they were feeling pressed for time when they were planning the service, but there was no information given to the congregation about what this song was. And um, as I sat in the congregation, I, I, people, people joined in, it's a singing congregation, but still there was this lack of thinking, well, what makes this so good? You know, like that's what I felt like people would be wondering why have they thought this one, and and um, I did speak to the to the music director afterwards and just said if if we could just introduce these with even two sentences to say this is from Korea that would have given people a framework to hang hang their singing on, and then um, and it's we're singing it this Sunday because it's Reign of Christ Sunday and it suits that theme and da, 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 da. it just would have taken a minute and a half and. I think then the responses that they will get will would have been would have been a little bit different because people would be understanding, you know. So it's just a simple thing to do. Can be very simple. Great. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Becca. Uh, shall we shift to the next question? Um, so what advice do you have for communities of faith who are attempting to sing justly? And would you be able to provide some examples of how communities of faith can sing more justly during this Advent season? I think we're going to give that one to you, Bruce. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we've we've done most of this already um, in what we've said so far. I would just highlight some of the things and expand a bit on some of what we've been talking about, like honoring a song in its original language to me is just so important. And so, and yes, like a four verse, a long four verse hymn in Mandarin is a lot harder for a majority Caucasian congregation to deal with than a song like Mungu Ni Mwe Ma. So you, you, you choose wisely when it comes to those things. But, my, you know, my congregation never learns a song in the English version. They learn it in the original, unless it's something like a four verse Mandarin hymn. <laughs> we learn it in the original language. We make sure that the English is up on screen as well, so people know what they're singing, because that is also an injustice when people are just forced to sing some syllables that mean nothing, and that gives meaning to that text. So the whole notion of, of taking, taking a song into our hearts the way it was originally conceived, and having that become part of our musical and cultural theological DNA is really really important and it expands who we are as people as people of faith so i would encourage folks to 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 do that to engage with songs um as becca was saying you know find people who who you know, original native speakers of the language to help you learn the song the number of church musicians i have met who who say oh my people won't sing in another language they just won't do it and i say but do you sing in other languages uh no well it comes back to to us as music leaders to do our work and also to do it with a sense of grace the fact that my korean will still be accented is okay we're that's not the point we're not into this for perfection we're into it for 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 justice reasons for just helping helping us all to to sing together 
and and to to widen the circle you know people say why do we have to sing in something other than english well it's because the worldwide church doesn't speak english it speaks many languages and so therefore you know if we have we would sing a song like jesu tabapano from from zimbabwe and we sing it in shona when we first introduced that song in my congregation we sang it for three or four months straight every single sunday as a piece of service music till it just became second nature to, to people and then one sunday lo and behold a visitor walks in from Zimbabwe and says, you were singing my song and you sang it in my language and there's tears rolling down his face. That's why we do this work. Whether those people are with us in person or whether they're just with us in the worldwide body of Christ, it's important. So doing, doing that kind of work of, of really, as Paul was saying, also introducing a piece, give it some context, Becca was saying that too, to, to really help people see why we sing these songs. They're not just a, you know, a snappy African chorus that, oh, there's great energy. Let's do it because it's snappy. We do it because it's a song, a way of singing in solidarity and embodying that worldwide presence of, of Christ. Uh, Bruce, did you want to sing any of the songs that you had? Would you want me to pull any up for you? Sure, I could do a little, a little taste of some things. Just grab my guitar. <laughs> it's right next door, thankfully. The work of collecting and curating music is always interesting too. You know, I'm somebody who has really enjoyed and had the privilege to be able to spend time in different church communities and and get to know them and as becca says get to know the songs that that are in their hearts so one of the communities i've been privileged to work with over the past number of years on multiple occasions was knox united church in winnipeg which is one of our most intercultural churches in the united church and the a large filipino community there mostly tagalog speaking but other languages as well and Salamat Sayo was a song that that people just loved and so I said well why don't we try and see if we can put this into notation because they all just knew it by by ear they've been singing it so long so somebody tracked down a YouTube video that was fairly close to what they had worked with and I did a transcription added some simple harmonies um, and then worked on a translation myself and literally I worked from Google Translate just taking the Tagalog and flipping it into English, and then I made it, you know, made it added verse and rhyme structure to it, and then took it to the community and said, "Is this representative? Does this, does this actually say what the original text says?" And and they mostly affirmed what I had done, and made a few suggestions. So it's really a collaborative kind of a process, putting the score together, um, which is now here and then when we were doing our consultations with our filipino community as part of the project this song came up from other communities as well so it's clearly well loved in in our communities our challenge now is because this came to us orally we're still trying to track down the original composer and author because this will be a composed song and so you, you you'll see in the sampler this is in there it was you know copyright not assigned and so on we're still we're still trying to do the justice piece with the song, but that's part of the journey too. And part of our modern reality in this YouTube age where music is out there and we can learn music and not really understand where it comes from. So can I, I add, add to that. that? Yeah, sure. I was just going to say what, what we, are we are doing, doing now, now with, with it. it. Sorry. I have an echo for myself is as you were saying, Bruce, we have the, we don't have the copyright assigned. So, one license is going to work with us to hold a pot of money so that if the person comes forward, we'll be able to pay them. Yes, thank you. Yes, so copyright, so royalties will be set aside and wait, waiting for, for the copyright holder to be identified. So I learned this in the original Tagalog, and of course my Tagalog will be accented, but I, I sing it proudly, and, and I 
I always seek for correction and <laughs> to grow in my understanding, but I'll sing it for you in the Tagalog and then also in the English. Salamat sa iyo Aking Panginoong Jesus Ako'y inibig mo Ang king lubos, ang tanging alay ko sa iyo, aking ama, ang buwang buhay ko, puso't kaluluwa, hindi makaya na may pagkaluwa. We're waiting for the next page. Mamahaling hiyas ni Gintong nilukob Ang tanging nadagin Sana ay tanggapin Ang tanging alay ko Nawa ay gamitin Ito lamang ama beautiful song that only comes to us because of spending time in community and that's what it's all about so we're doing our best to reach out to our communities our various um, groups in the United Church and, and saying what what are your heart songs and can we bring these in and we won't manage all of that in this round but as Paul was saying then let us sing as a platform we can add to as we go on and so we can continue to do this work That'll be very important. Um, I put up a couple of other um, op songs as well that we could have a quick, just a quick look at. Santo, 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 which many of us will likely know already. This was in Voices United in the, Eng in the English and the Spanish, and it was in No Voix Uni as well with, with French. So what we have done here is bring it all together into one score. And we also corrected, and it's it's an inadvertent injustice. During the making of Voices United, someone thought it would be kind of nice to flip it into triple time. And so the song went into the book in a triple time, a 6-4 kind of a feel. But um, this is a song, it is a folk song from Argentina, and the original folk rhythm that, that the song goes with is, is a duple time kind of a rhythm. Um, there's an accompaniment rhythm. It's and so to to take the song out of the original time signature and and um, do something else with it um, was a sign of disrespect for some people from Argentina. And so we've restored it. We took the same harmonies. That's one of our principles too. From people people know the harmonies in their book in the hymn book already. So this is the same harmonies that we had in Voices United, just reinterpreted rhythmically. Santo, 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 mi corazón te adora, mi corazón te sabe. 
So just bringing it back into the original, and this is this rhythm is how it's published in every other collection I've ever seen. So it also brings us into into line with with other collections. The other song I wanted to mention briefly, this is the Voices United score for 241, O Sing to Our God. And yes, if you look down at the bottom of the page, you can see that it's a Brazilian folk song, but the original language has been erased in this score. It's also in uh, John Bell arrangement, and um, it's just English translation. So one of the things that we're doing in the collection, you've probably seen in the sampler, this is this is new for us. Um, books have always kind of favored the dominant community in terms of how they lay things out. So most hymn books, because most of their people using the book are English speakers, they'll always put English language first. We're putting the original language first in in all cases. Um, in a song like Jokuseo, um, hymn books tend to publish it with just the phonetic Korean. We are putting the actual Korean characters in there because our Korean speakers need to be able to sing it in their original language so and then we can sing along with syllables so it's the same kind of principle will apply for for um, cantai au senor as O oh, sing to our God should be cantai au senor the other thing about this song is it's often done with a lot of life and energy and a fairly quick tempo. But I was working with um, a Brazilian music scholar who was chastising the North American music leadership community because the song is is more like Senzenina from South Africa. It's a song of asking for God's presence in our midst and celebrating joy in the midst of adversity. And so traditionally, it's a sung a lot slower than we tend to do it. So I'll just sing you a little bit. Cantai ao Senhor um cantico novo. 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 Cantai ao Senhor, cantai ao Senhor. So once again, you know, the sense of context, the amount of work we can do to to um, learn the to learn where a song comes from and how it is used in its original context is is so important and it's I'm excited to be able to to bring some of this to to life on the page in our new collection and yes it will put those of us who look like me at a disadvantage <laughs> because there's less English verses on the page interlined with the music and you have to deal with other languages and all of that but it's it's about making that page accessible to as many communities as possible all at once so that's important work can, can, can I, I dovetail? Dove tail on, whoops, whoops, sorry. sorry. <laughs> on, something on something that Ruby said. said. You will need to. There we go. Um, which about language? I just really appreciate you sinking into the question of language, and I, I, I wanted to just share a little anecdote. When, when we, when I worked um, in downtown Toronto with uh, an Anglo, English speaking and Spanish speaking congregation who did their worship together, some of the English speaking uh, folks uh, complained about having to sing so much in Spanish. And there are lots of ways of doing that. But one of the, th the, the th opportunities that I feel like I missed was the opportunity to say to the people who were struggling with singing in Spanish, you know, can you not see this as a um, kind of radical welcoming that has that means you have to work hard, like the the people that you're singing with have to do that work every day because they're functioning in a language that isn't their own, and so it's a way of 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 
building in some some kind of educational um, uh, opportunity for, for for theological reflection about what it means to be um, in Canada if you're not an English or French speaker uh, in in those contexts. And I mean, the same would be true for um, speaking like as the United Church struggles with how to be a, a, also a French speaking denomination, like those are the, 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 the <laughs> questions that come into play. And so when we sing in another language, we are doing some of the work that some people have to do every hour of every day. And so, I mean, I don't know if it, it's not, it, it's not really necessarily a question of disadvantaging people that look like me and Bruce, but more like writing the balance, you know, yes. kind of. Um, so anyhow, I just really appreciated um, the way that you laid out how the question of language is so connected to the question of um, anti, a commitment to anti-racism and to interculturality. Like those are all deeply connected. And it, I could also just raise a practical thing too like I mean, as, as i said if we put the spanish for a song up on screen we'll have the english as well and i know there are people in my community who 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 will just shut down entirely rather than sing in spanish and so i say you know please try and sing in the spanish do your best but if it is such a barrier for you that you can no longer worship sing in the english while we're singing in the spanish multilingual singing is a beautiful thing because it reflects the fact that we are diverse so we're not about creating barriers. It is about opportunities. And yes, I think one of the most important things we can ever do is, is experience worship as a newcomer, as an outsider as well, to, to, to go somewhere where you, you don't know the language or you barely know the language and, and see how that feels to be on the outside trying to, to understand. So that's, that's part of, you're right, that's part of what we can do by doing this is helping people see that you know the way they've always done worship isn't necessarily the only way. Thank you. So our last question for the panel, and this is for everyone to respond to. What is your hope for the anti-racism work within Then Let Us Sing? And where would you like to see this work in five years time? I can start with that one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a lot of hopes for then let us sing in the anti-racism work of the church, but what I have learned from being a part of this amazing community that I like to brag is bigger than general counsel executive. Like <laughs> there's a lot of us working on this together and we have committed to do it as a team, which is beautiful. And the way that we have been able to model the struggle of it all, I think is beautiful. And what I do hope for the rest of the church, there's been a real um, grace and appreciation for the gifts that people bring and a real grace when, when we go through various phases of COVID fog, when our mind slips, when life happens, when we get something wrong, we've been able to say, oh, we can do better. And then we correct it. And I think the grace of knowing that we can't do all of it, we can't even do half of it, but we're gonna do our best and we're gonna, and we're gonna try and pave the road. Like we're gonna do the absolute best that we can and we're gonna try and make it easier for the next group of people coming. I hope that that's something that all churches and all of us can continue to do. Like, I love the modeling of, we're not out to fix it. We're not out to be saviors. We're out to help, to help us become something better. We're out to kind of do the kingdom work. And I hope that for the church and I hope that for the, the committee. And I, I think that that ethos and mindset of honoring each other and doing the best that we can with what we got when we got it is a beautiful thing that I hope will continue 
and then let us sing five years from now and 10 years from now. There's something really beautiful about a dynamic online platform. When we see that it's wrong, we could just be like, oh, okay, let's just change it. Like, we don't need to reprint a book. We just need to learn. And when we know better, we do better. And that's a beautiful thing. And I, I hope that we can model that as a church, the ways that I don't want to use the pivot word because that became a very bad word in 2022 that we don't want to repeat. But like, but how we are able to change when we learn something and the we've, I, I feel like as the committee, we have lost some of that defensiveness that I often experienced when doing anti-racism work in other environments. And I really value that. And I hope that we can help the church in other areas kind of lose that defensiveness and kind of have that humility of like, oh, dang, that's not great. And how can we change it? Yeah, I would I would echo all of that, Olivia, and just say as what you're saying about this being a framework that we have created that we can keep adding to, that we can keep correcting. Because yeah, we won't get everything right. We won't have it's so to be able to add a new language when somebody comes up with a new translation, we can have sixty three languages with Munguni Mwema in the long run. And those kinds of things really excite me. The fact that this is this is a platform to be expanded on in future it's and it's true books do freeze things it's in your book it's printed that way and we're stuck with it that way unless you put out a new book so that's one of the the beauties of of this platform and i should say for people who if, currently we only really have budget and time etc to do a single score for every song but in the long run there can be additional scores so ones that that might favor a certain language group to make it easier for them to learn it ones that have capo chords simple capo chords for guitar players those kinds of things so that that will all be in the future and once again it's it's thanks to it being a a, a platform rather than a book I guess succinctly, like I just, I, I believe in the power of song to be transformative. I fundamentally believe it. And I believe that singing has not only can, uh, can release transformative energy, but it, it is, it has power. And, and because of that, my, my I'm going to go all lofty and just say that I hope that that this project of, of Then Let Us Sing and the commitment to embody the values and the ethos of the United Church will actually transform the church so that, so that there'll be people in leadership, more people in leadership that look like Olivia and Adele and, uh, um, and other people who are in the room today and that people who look like me will sure, still be involved in leadership, but make some room and step aside and, and let other voices sing about justice. So that would be, that would be, that's a treasured and risky and vulnerable hope that I have. Yeah, Yeah, there I'm back on. Uh, yeah, I, I I agree with uh, what's been what's been said by the other three, and I I think for me, um, uh, seeing the church in five years that where we no longer resist singing um, music that is in a foreign language, for example, or or throws images at us that we find difficult or we find difficult to understand why we should sing a certain way I, to have a church where um, where that's past us. And now as congregations and as a denomination, we are um, we've grown and, 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 and ready to embrace the changes we need to make and that they're no brainers, you know, sort of. Um, I, yeah, that 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 it's it's just matter of fact that this is who we are and this is how we sing and and it supports who who we are and who we who we profess to be. I think it was a phrase in in some of the ethics justice and education committee about 
becoming the, uh, singing, um, uh, helping the church become the church we want to become, something like that. That that that's our goal, and I, to have us uh, in that situation would be uh, to get us in that point of five years would be wonderful. So, I see now that it is twenty after eight, and I see the closing slide has come up, which means we should be closing. Um, so I'm going to suggest we we have a we're going to close. Uh, at this point with a prayer we still have a couple of things to sing and um, we're going to share this prayer it, it came from becca uh, came to us yesterday and uh, i'd like to us to pray this together and then we're going to sing a paraphrase of the lord's prayer in french from a composer in quebec named lambert he's written a beautiful paraphrase of the lord's prayer that i'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate and will that'll be one of our closing songs Please join me as we pray. Tender and compassionate God, whose, sounds just, whose voice sounds justice throughout creation, help us to sing justly. Be with us when our bodies vibrate with the joy of praising you as part of the body of Christ. Liberate me so that, liberate us so that we might help build your realm of justice and peace. Weave together the sinews of our beings so that I am ready, we are ready to welcome the tender, subversive, and justice-seeking breath of the Holy Spirit. Convert us to another song, another way of singing, that our singing might become a praxis of liberation, a cry for justice, a celebration of life. In the name of God the singer, Jesus the song, and the Holy Spirit who sings, amen. So I'm going to introduce to you the Lord's Prayer, Notre Père, Notre Mère, by Lambert from Quebec. And I, if I turn my original sound on, I hope it is going to be all right. It's not echoing. No, okay. I actually have the accompaniment. I was in touch with uh, Lambert because uh, a congregation wanted to introduce this before the sampler was actually released. So I contacted him personally, and he was very generous and gracious, and even sent me this piano accompaniment that he's, uh, he'd written himself for the prayer. So here we go. Oh, 
que de quand ton cœur. Notre Père, notre Mère, que nos vies soient dépilées, qui nous élève jusqu'à toi. Amen. Thank you to Olivia, Becca, Bruce, and Paul, and to the entire Then Let Us Sing team. Um, thank you all for your engagement this evening uh, and for leading us in this very thoughtful, prayerful time of reflection and challenge. We're deeply, deeply grateful. Um, as noted, this is the last event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. It's recorded. Um, past recordings are all available on YouTube, so you're welcome to flip through those um, and share them more widely. If you have additional questions about Then Let Us Sing, um, you're welcome to email my staff colleague, Olivia. Her email is in the chat, asmith at united-church.ca. Uh, she will receive your questions as well. Um, uh, Lydia has a few more closing words, but when you do press the leave button from this gathering time, um, there'll be a very short feedback survey that appears. Um, please, if you can take a few minutes to fill that out, that'd be great. Um, we would love to hear from you. So thanks again for being here and um, over to you, Lydia. Uh, thank you. I don't actually have any other closing words, except of course, if you have any questions about Then Let Us Sing, please do reach out. If you go to the Then Let Us Sing website, the first thing that will happen, it will be sign up for our newsletter. We won't spam you. Every six weeks or so, we'll send you pertinent information. And I wonder, Becca, do you feel like singing us out or are you? Sure, I can. Yeah, why not? I see Deborah smiling at me in the middle of the room. Hi, Deborah <laughs> from BC. Um, anyhow, this is a song that she knows. So I expect to see you dancing. Uh, I learned this song from a choir of hotel workers in downtown Toronto, and I sing it to honor them um, and to remember all the times on the picket line and at demonstrations um, when we sang this song. And I share it with you now. The words are on the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me, fire, fire, fire. That's it. Like it's pretty, pretty easy. And it's um, I'll just put original sound on goes like this. I'm going to sing a line, you sing it back. On the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. Okay, I want to hear you sing it. You ready? On the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. The second line is like this, and that's it. Fire, 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 fire fall on me. Okay, now I want to hear you. Fire, 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 fire fall on me. And that's the whole song. So let's just sing it through a couple times. And I, I, I wish you rhythm and life and joy in the rest of your evening. On the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. On the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. Fire, fire, fire. Fire fall on me. Fire, fire, fire. Fire fall on me. You can screen dance too. On the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. Yes, I love it. On the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. Fire, 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 fire fall on me. Fire, 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 fire fall on me. One more time. On the day of Pentecost, Fire fall on me on the day of Pentecost. Fire fall on me. Fire, fire, fire. Fire fall on me. Fire, fire, fire. Fire fall on me. Fantastic.
fantastic. We should sing that for about half an hour. That would be the way to do it right. <laughs> Blessings, everyone.